thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to welcome the first panel session of the day. I'm Ellie Groves, Managing Director of the Economic and Monetary Policy Institute at OMFIS. And very excited to start the, start the day with an overview of the macroeconomic outlook and Europe's path to growth. So, <laughs> having, uh, so please do welcome uh, the, uh, the panelists here. We've unfortunately had two panelists joining virtually due to strike action and uh, COVID-related uh, things. So please, you, Rolf, why don't you sit next to me here? Um, Mam sit there, and then Agnes at the end. So very pleased to welcome the speakers. We have Agnes basset curie who's the chief economist in the French Trésor. We have Mam Fato, head of division, uh, country studies for Europe at the OECD. Uh, on screen, we will have Marco Buti, Chief of Staff to the Commissioner for Econ Economy, uh, Paolo Gentiloni for European Commission. You will probably all know uh, Marco Buti from his many years throughout the Commission, so very pleased to have uh, him. And then we have Riccardo Bibieri, Chief Economist, Director of Economic and Financial Research at the Italian Treasury, uh, Department of Economy, Ministry of Finance, who is there. I see him on screen, so <laughs> very good. And then we have Rolf Strach, the Chief Economist uh, and member of the Management Board at the ESM. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to start quite quickly, and I would like, I'm going to go to Mam first for an overview of the OECD's view on the outlook for European growth, inflation, and, uh, and whether we will be going into a recession. So those are the key, key topics, but Mam, over to you, please. Okay, well, thank you. I'm pleased to start the discussion with um, a few words about the economic outlook. And um, my remarks will be based mostly on um, the econo OECD economic outlook, which we released at the beginning of this month. Um, I will start with two main observations um, on the outlook and, uh, and also two main risks. Uh, and just then I will say two words about uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, so first, on our baseline, um, we, we have obviously substantially revised down our growth projections for 2022 and 2023 around the world, uh, but especially in Europe. The conflict in Europe and the supply chain disruptions uh, that, we, that, that were already emerging um, last year uh, and had been made worse by the shutdowns mm. in, uh, in China are now undermining the, the recovery. And uh, many of the hardest hit countries are uh, in Europe, of course, because of the dependency on energy imports from Russia. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, the, the, the slowdown is also cushioned uh, by um, quite good labor markets uh, around Europe, uh, which helps with consumption. Uh, there is also the implementation of the next generation EU funds, EU recovery plan, sorry. And uh, we also have um, the um, uh, fiscal support uh, form that was uh, uh, extended during, uh, during COVID um, and uh, which is also uh, helping um, consumers and firms. So overall in the Euro area, we have revised down the, the growth to 2.6% in 2022 and 1.6% uh, in 2023. Uh, this is the baseline, and I will talk later <laughs> about the, the risks, of course. Uh, second, on the inflation front, uh, the inflationary pressures have both increased and broadened. Um, before the war, there were hopes that um, the tensions, that the inflationary pressures that we were already seeing um, would be temporary, that um, uh, the, 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 um, it was just a matter of a uh, short time, uh, but the war has crashed those hopes. Uh, and now uh, with higher energy and food price inflation, uh, which, is, we have, which has already reached a 40-year high in countries like Germany or, or the UK, for example, uh, and of course, in Eastern Europe, which is which also has uh, has high higher inflation at the moment, um, we expect a, a gradual reduction um, of supply chain or commodity and commodity price uh, pressures, 
And um, because of that, we, we think also that the, the impact of rising rates will start to be felt. Um, and so we, we, we plan a gradual decline in, in the inflation outlook, but uh, still at the end of 2023, uh, to for core if inflation to be still above the, the targets uh, throughout, uh, throughout Europe. So the, um, oh, just to summarize, since I have only five minutes, the, we, we actually, we, we have therefore inflation um, reaching 7% in 2022 and uh, only declining to four, four and a half, about 4.5% four in 2023. Uh, so in this time of high uncertainty, one can be tempted uh, to talk more about risks than about the baseline, but I will um, refrain from that uh, for the sake of time. I'll just mention one key risk that is on everybody's minds uh, currently, which is the um, um, stop, uh, full stop or uh, some shock to the supply so of gas and, uh, and other fossil uh, fuel imports from Russia, not just on the prices. Uh, so there are many such simulation exercises, including in Germany, uh, at the OECD, we did one uh, for uh, the, the, a, a global simulation exercise, and uh, we expect that uh, such a stop could actually um, reduce manufacturing output by about 3%, and, uh, and so could uh, lower growth by more than 1.5% and inflation, increase inflation by, by over 1 percentage points. Um, another uh, related risk uh, that uh, would be a supply shock on other uh, raw materials like um, rare metals uh, or rare gases that are used in manufacturing, uh, which would also have um, commensurate effects on the, on the growth outlook. Yeah. So uh, finally, uh, the, the, the second shock risk that I wanted to mention was about wages. Uh, because uh, we could expect second round um, effects of higher inflation through the labor market. Um, so far, the corporate surveys point to a gradual pickup in, in wages. Uh, we haven't seen yet uh, a marked acceleration of wage growth, uh, but to be seen, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, where with uh, expected rises in the minimum wages, we could have uh, much, much higher wage growth. Uh, so, two very quick words on monetary and fiscal policy in this, uh, the context of this outlook. On monetary policy, uh, at this point, uh, I think there is broad agreement that removing monetary accommodation is warranted, uh, but particular, particular caution is also warranted in Europe, uh, where the, 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 the dynamics I've just uh, described on inflation are uh, mostly uh, related to supply side uh, uh, shocks than, rather than uh, being demand driven. Uh, and so uh, we, we think that removing the accommodation in a gradual fa fashion is appropriate uh, and to be modulated based uh, uh, on, you know, to be whether if we observe that, uh, you know, wage growth remains contained, that, um, um, <coughs> the, um, uh, sorry, that the, um, uh, the impact of the conflict on growth is, is, uh, is, uh, is larger than we expected or not. And, and on fiscal policy management, uh, it's also particularly complex in Europe at this stage uh, because of the current growth, we think that um, the, the economy-wide income support is no longer warranted um, but uh, at the same time, many countries have uh, delayed the, the, the fiscal adjustments that, uh, plans that they, they, they had to at least 2023. Uh, and we think that fiscal consolidation should not be delayed if demand pressures turn out to also, um, also become apparent in, in inflation. So with that, I, I stop the outlook. I hope I haven't exceeded my five minutes. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. And there are definitely further topics that we can unpack uh, later. I should have said at the start, just remind everybody to ask their questions via the Slido app as well. So please do uh, make it as interactive as possible in the room as well. Uh, do we have Marco Buti on the line yet? Uh, is 
I am online, if oh. you can hear me. Uh, the, uh, the, we can hear you very well, so excellent. The, uh, uh, the booming voice of Marco Vizzi. I'm very pleased to have you in the room uh, with your voice there. So I wanted to go to you next because when we were speaking before, you had interesting discussions on the trade-offs that needed. Ah, there you are. I can see your, see your face as well now, which is excellent. Uh, so the trade-offs between uh, the resp policy responses that were needed with COVID-19 and now looking towards the Russian invasion in Ukraine and how Europe responds to these two crises. So I would like to go to you to give that overview from the Commission. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Sorry for not being there. I've been a uh, victim uh, of uh, you know, strikes at the Brussels airport. Uh, um, um, I think the, if you look at the situation now and um, uh, where we stood in uh, uh, spring 2020 when COVID hit us, uh, um, I think the conclusion is that we are facing now considerably sharper trade-offs than at the time. I mean, dealing with COVID was hard politically, very difficult to cross red lines also <coughs> at the European level, uh, both in Frankfurt and Brussels, uh, with the PEP on the one hand, uh, with suspending the rules of the uh, SGP with next generation EU. It was hard politically, but it was not hard economically. I mean, we, it was clear what to do. So I think that we did not face uh, dramatic um, trade-offs uh, at the time. We are facing sharper, much sharper trade-offs now, essentially three to summarize one is a stabilization trade-off and i think it has been alluded to though i was a bit late in joining the panel um, so stabilization trade-off between essentially growth inflation you know financial stability slash fragmentation the second one is a sustainability trade-off between fiscal environmental and social and the third one I want to dub it an efficiency trade-off. And this is related to how much shorter would the value chain become looking forward. I think on the first one, uh, just to give you, uh, you know, a, a, a snapshot, uh, so the stabilization of trade-off, I think um, fiscal method is going to monitor more of this gradual acceleration. Uh, normalization, I think, is well... Uh, it's well taken. Uh, I don't want to, to intrude uh, in uh, uh, you know ECB job on this uh, side. I think on the fiscal side, um, the key issue is the degree of persistency of the supply shock. If one takes the view, uh, which is I think is a prudent one, uh, that the, the the shock is actually longer lasting uh, and not just you know a temporary a temporary transient one then I think uh, um, we have to have, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, fiscal policy which uh, uh, supports low income, uh, is targeted, timely, temporary, so the, the famous three Ts in a different environment, but there is no reason for having an overall expansionary uh, trade-off, and the behavior of member states will have to be uh, different depending on the level of public debt and sustainability uh, um, uh, risks. Um, on the financial stability trade-off, this is the debate on fragmentation that we have uh, now with the ECB having to make uh, some uh, uh, proposals and we expect them in the next uh, weeks. Within the sustainability trade-off, I think here the fiscal, environmental and social, um, member states have gone overwhelmingly for lessening the, um, the problems on the, um, by price policy measures, excise duties on energy, for instance. This one here you know, helps out uh, to a certain extent, but sharpens the, 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 the environmental sustainability. We have done studies and uh, shown actually that uh, going directly for temporary income support is considerably better from the point of view of uh, greenhouse emissions but also from the point of view of sustaining income. And finally, the efficiency trade-off, and I stop with that, I think looking forward is probably the nastiest one. 
uh, and this is uh, we have entering a, we have entered a world where there is a, a there is a, a dilemma there is a tension between uh, efficiency comparative uh, respecting comparative advantages uh, so exploiting uh, you know long the benefits of long value chains while at the same time you know facing an issue of security you know autonomy robustness as we have seen also during the COVID with the vaccine uh, uh, vaccine issue. So on that, I think uh, implementing um, Repower EU um, as proposed by the Commission, agreeing quickly on that next generation EU with the plans would, I think, would help on that front. But I think we still, we still do not have the full answer to how you reconcile this, uh, you know, robustness uh, and uh, security issues with uh, continuing to trade. I mean, some have actually indicated that uh, the, in this world of shorter value chains, the, the right comparison is not going back to, you know, uh, to the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s. It's, it looks like more of a global Brexit given the degree of interplay interactions that we have, uh, mutual defense <laughs> that we have uh, the current glo uh, global economy. I stop here. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, if, if uh, you will allow me. When we're talking about timelines, so mentioning the, the long and short, the short timelines of the crisis, what would you consider to be long, medium, or short term? I, I always have that question because it's a, is it transitory with inflation? I guess the first question is, is it transitory with inflation? And what would you consider transitory to be? Is it one year, two years? Or, uh, and what is, and with the, with the crisis in, in Ukraine, obviously it's very hard to say, but from your perspective, what would be, what would be a, a long crisis there? What would you consider? Um, as you say, very difficult to tell, I think, um, I mean, we uh, the, uh, this we are going to issue our our uh, interim summer forecast on the 13th of July, um, and uh, um, I think, as um, in the case of other international organisations, I think we we tend to reason more in terms of scenarios mm -hmm. rather than outright the forecasts. Um, I mean, they're very difficult to to. Um, address up a baseline. I think uh, it is more the, the extent, the width of the fan chart that is more important than the actual baseline. So, um, so I cannot really answer that question there. I think what we need to do, uh, and I think it's more important from a policy making perspective, is to devise policies which are robust to the two, to the different length of the, uh, of the policies rather than speculating on how long it will last. So, for instance, for <coughs> us, we may come back later, if you so wish. I think it's very important to come rapidly to an agreement on the new economic gov EU economic governance reform of the fiscal rules and make them consistent with uh, a, a, a crisis that may be, uh, may be short or may be longer, uh, longer lasting. Thank you very much. Uh, on that discussion, Ricardo, I would like to bring you in here too to talk around the challenges from inflation and the risk of spreads as well. I'm sure that that is going to be the key, uh, key thought on everybody's mind. So please do offer your perspective from the business cycle within Italy as well. Good morning. Um, obviously, in, in, uh, in my position, I normally tend to downplay risks. Mm. Um, as we have done also in our official documents. But since last year, we did, um, for the few that, that read our documents, but we, we did insert some passages that highlighted our concern and my personal concern about inflation risks. And I think <clears throat> since last year, things have clearly evolved in a direction that points to a longer period of relatively high inflation, uh, certainly with, with a tendency towards deglobalization, uh, which um, I think many people view just in negative terms, 
they look at the business cycle only looking at the negative side of the deglobalization process and they forget that if at some point we rely to a lesser extent on production carried out in Asia, we bring it back to Europe, that means more employment, that means more growth, that means more technological innovation. However, that is happening against, uh, particularly in countries like Italy, um, a demographic trend and trends in uh, youth labor market participation that um, point to possibly shortages of skills, shortages of labor, which we are already uh, observing in sectors as diverse as, say, electronic engineering on the one hand and construction, the construction sector on the other. So I think in addition to the fact that central banks have been uh, creating trillions worth of liquidity over the past uh, 10 years or more, so we have the monetary conditions for inflation, we also have the geopolitical uh, uh, conditions in place for this to be a longer period of relatively high inflation. I'm saying relatively high because I'm hoping that the highs in inflation we saw in the 70s and early 80s uh, will be avoided uh, also because we learned from past mistakes. In, in what ways can we try and limit the rise in inflation by using fiscal policy, um, broadly defined? And why is that? Well, primarily because uh, this spike in energy prices leads to an unexpected um, increase in tax revenue. Uh, obviously, the doctrine, the prevailing view on fiscal policy would say this is a windfall gain, use it to reduce public debt. But we are in very ex uh, extreme circumstances at the moment. You can use that um, upside that you're getting, that windfall, <clears throat> from um, higher energy prices to alleviate the impact on, on the consumer, to alleviate the impact on poorer households, on energy-intensive firms, uh, which is what Italy has done and other European countries have done over the past 12 months. And, and I think it has uh, succeeded at moderating uh, the rise in inflation, and I think this is what uh, probably will continue to happen uh, for some time. Then at some point, obviously, having seen peaks in energy prices that are totally irrational vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, you know, the actual cost of, say, extracting natural gas, this initial impulse uh, will probably recede. Uh, hopefully, also, the, the <coughs> question with um, food prices will be resolved. And so I guess most forecasters expect that year-over-year uh, -year inflation will decline over the course of next year. At that point, most probably wages will begin to catch up. So I think a fair prediction is that, as I said before, we are heading for a period of um, higher inflation than what we've seen in recent years, uh, hopefully not as high as this year, it might help to some extent uh, improve the, the um, dynamic of government debt or the debt ratio uh, to the extent that uh, consumer price inflation uh, moves more towards the deflator of, of GDP and we get more of a benefit in terms of nominal growth of, of GDP. So. Clearly, we, we have to view this um, as a significant risk, but I think it's also important to react the right way, and, and that opens, obviously, the question of central banks, but perhaps you want to deal with it in a second round of questions, because I don't think that in Europe we've had um, the ideal policy response, in, at least in terms of sequencing, and the recent... Uh, bout of volatility and pressure on spreads could have been avoided.
Thank you. Yes, we will definitely go on to that in a second round. I think that the discussion on the monetary policy response to to the to their sequencing of normalization i think will be very interesting to get into and i would like your thoughts there uh, ricardo but before then i'd like to go to Agnes to discuss the french presidency of the eu council which is coming to an end but also the the positives that have come out of it the priorities that you set out and what is uh, wh where is there more to do thank you Eli. uh Perhaps if I can say a word about inflation, yes. uh, because I very much agree with, with what Ricardo just said. If you think that uh, energy prices are not going to increase by 40% per year uh, forever, uh, if you think that uh, gas prices are not going to be multiplied by six every year, uh, then uh, at some point there is a plateau, a high plateau, and uh, the fact that governments are, to a certain extent, buffering the increase in inflation, um, it makes inflation uh, uh, yes, inflation is higher than it used to be, but uh, it increases in a smoother way. So this gives uh, the central bank, the ECB, more time to react. <coughs> uh, so I, I think the policy mix uh, that could come uh, out of this uh, could be quite smart. Uh, if... <laughs> It's a plateau. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we, are, we are back to, to our scenarios uh, uh, Marco was uh, alluding to. So I'm not going to escape uh, what you asked me to, to do. Uh, uh, the, the French presidency of the EU is just about to, to finish. Uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, the common theme of this presidency was the, idea, the, the concept of European sovereignty. And at that time, not everybody was uh, understanding exactly what it was about. Was There was... Uh, also uh, even some suspicion <laughs> that the French would hide a kind of agenda of deglobalization behind this concept. Um, however, at the beginning of the year already, uh, the international context was much less friendly uh, with the ongoing uh, trade and technology, uh, te technology conflicts between the US and China and the, European, uh, the Europeans be being squeezed uh, in between and also already uh, increasing energy prices, uh, su supply chain uh, disruptions, uh, and the recognition that they to, to, to succeed in the green transition, which was extremely ambitious, mm. uh, there was a need to for some kind of control over the value chains. So uh, there was already a case for uh, European sovereignty, and then the Russian invasion of Ukraine started in uh, end of February, and suddenly uh, the concept of European sovereignty became existential. And here you can uh, read again the uh, declaration of, uh, after the Versailles summit um, in March 10 and 11, uh, quote unquote, Russia's war of aggression constitutes a techno techno tectonic, sorry, tectonic shift in European history. And then uh, the objective was spelled out of, quote unquote, protecting our citizens, values, democracies, and our European model. So it's a very high ambition. And three dimensions were spelled out, uh, bolstering our defense capa capabilities, reducing our energy dependencies, the Repower EU plan uh, <coughs> is, uh, of course, uh, at the center of it, and building a more robust economic base. Uh, so, um, I, I'm not going to talk about the sanctions because it was also <laughs> a very large part of, of, um, of the, this semester <coughs> uh, with quite good co cooperation on this, the sanctions on the one hand and the emergency uh, assistance to, to Ukraine on the other hand. I'm going to focus on a few achievements on the uh, economic uh, agenda. So uh, I, I thought that Marco would uh, talk about uh, recovery and resilience plans, uh, that almost all, all of them have been now adopted. Mm. On, only one is missing, as you know. And uh, this uh, means that already 60 billion euros of grants have been dispersed and 33 billion of loans. And this is yeah. uh, 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 only part of it. So the, in, in terms of recovery, it's really a shift, a huge shift uh, in terms of uh, the reaction uh, to the crisis. Then, of course, you are interested here in, the in how to finance growth and the green trans transformation. I, I very much agree with what Bjorn uh, Serim said at the beginning. 
uh, banking union, capital market unions are really key. Mm -hmm. So as you know, the banking union agenda is very difficult and the progress is very slow, or, although there is some progress, but uh, highly <laughs> visible. Uh, you need a microscope probably to, to, <laughs> to find it. Uh, on capital market union, I would not be so pessimistic. Um, I think that uh, there has been a, a good revision of uh, the 2015 uh, regulation on the European Long-Term Investment Fund, mm. which uh, was thought as too restrictive, and it's, it's been much more flexible. So it uh, paves the way for much more uh, uh, large-scale investment in SMEs, in infrastructure, in a pan-European way. So I think this is a very good advance. Uh, then there are uh, several initiatives that have been agreed on uh, for transparency and reporting. So I know that the reporting burden is very uh, uh, heavy for, for the financial sector, but if you want to, uh, uh, to shift uh, the, the, the savings um, from short-term liquid uh, investments in, into the long-term green investment, you need to be very careful in terms of reporting, in terms of transparency. So there's the CS CSRD uh, directive, the ESAP directive, so these are very good advances. And on the, in the area of uh, public private uh, partnerships, you have these uh, important projects of common European interests. Uh, so here there has been also some progress, especially in the ar areas of hydrogen and health. We know that it's hugely expensive. Mm. These are hugely expensive investments. Then you have the di digital agenda with uh, a, a very good achievement in terms of the Digital Market Act to foster competition in uh, through the regulation of very large platforms, and the Digital Services Act, DSA, Consumer Protection. So in a, in a way, this is at the core of the European sovereignty uh, concept where uh, Europe wants to go its own way with its own standards. Uh, moving, and I, I'm almost finished, <laughs> moving to the external agenda, uh, they, there's this uh, reciprocity, uh, this new tool of international procurement instrument to make reciprocity in public procurement a reality. This is very important. And uh, um, last but not least, we are very proud of this, uh, on the green agenda, the Council Agreement on the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM. Mm. It's not that this is <laughs> the the bullet point for the greening, of course not, but it's going to unlock another, uh, unlock the whole agenda. If you, you don't have an agreement on this, it's very difficult to find an agreement on uh, the major, uh, on the major uh, components of the green, uh, Fit for 55 agenda. And I will finish with something that is very practical for all of you, uh, an agreement on the single charger. So starting January next year, there will be only one type of charger for your mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> so that seems a large agenda and a lot to get through in a time when you also had an election. So um, I think the France... Four elections. <laughs> four elections. <laughs> Not just one, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, it's, there's a l definitely a lot within Europe, a lot to cover from the Green Agenda to digitalization. Uh, Rolf, I want to come to you to have a perspective from the ESM and your thoughts on the policy response to COVID, Ukraine and various other elements. I think we will also touch on how to finance that green agenda, but maybe we can do that in a second round <laughs> when we go back. So, Rolf, over to you. Thank you very much um, for the great panel, for the hospitality yesterday and now, which was really outstanding. Now let me offer a few thoughts from an ESM perspective and basically three points. The first one I think it's important to also acknowledge as we go through this to which extent actually the policy space for Europe is tightened from an inter-global perspective and due to global forces. We know it was a war but what comes with it is obviously this terms of trade shock that we are experiencing which is historically big. And the way it works is that this means uh, important transfer of income and wealth out of Europe to other areas. Mm. We also note that this is not the case for the US and here there is a clear differentiation also to earlier situations. So if we are conscious of that, it means that there is 
probably little hope that we can have that you can truly compensate for that, you can mitigate for it, but otherwise you need to adjust. And that also goes a bit to what Agnes said, is yes, inflation dynamics should change, but if we have a permanent shift in relative prices of export and import, the economy needs to adjust in a different way over time. Here comes the medium-term perspective again. again. Mm. Second element, important globally, you see a lot of talking about monetary policy reaction of the ECB and tightening, but we need to be conscious, of course, that the tightening that we see in monetary policy is to a large extent a spillover from the US. Um, there are different phases that you can have, but I mean, we know that a one percentage point increase in US rates also means about 0.5 in Europe in terms of yield developments that, that we see. So that is important to keep in mind when we think about policies and the policy framework. Second point, market reaction, the way we look at it, it's so far market adjustment, and Ricardo has talked about it, it's not market dysfunctionality, very clearly. I mean, obviously, markets face a great deal of uncertainty in terms of what is the end point of the monetary policy cycling cycle that we are now going in on a global scale. What is the end point for the US, the end point for the euro area? There are the countervailing forces that were described very nicely. On the one hand, you have the cost push shock coming, higher inflation. On the other hand, you have the recession risk. I mean, as a reaction to that, you see less market liquidity, you see volatility. We think that should settle as we get more clarity on the policy path, on the, on the policy mix as it comes yeah. forward. And let me make then a third point on fiscal and monetary <laughs> policy and, put, and focus also on an aspect that has, I think, not been mentioned sufficiently with a view to resilience. Monetary policy had to tighten, fiscal policy has to react as well, and I can agree with a lot what was what you said, what Marco said, Ricardo said. I think on a European scale, unanimity and clarity and action in, in uh, the short term to support the most vulnerable, and well taken, that should be the case. Second one, Europe stands out as the continent that also has most of a medium term vision on where to go and can build on next generation EU in getting there was also said and is very clear and is a positive. Third point is I think there is still scope for better policy coordination when it comes to dealing with inflation, fighting inflation, because we see high dispersion of inflation rates across Europe. But let me in that respect also very clearly point out in the medium term, and that is for me three to five years. <laughs> Thank where, you. <laughs> where I see resilience that we should keep in mind. And there are three elements of resilience that I see. Sure. First, labor markets are really strong. And we should note the important shift to the earlier crisis. In earlier crisis, you would have many people migrating out of the labor markets. And if you look at the 1980s, you had a fall in participation. We have not seen this in the past crisis. We have not seen it in this crisis. Labor markets in Europe have changed due to reforms. Second point, debt, debt servicing costs. Yes, debt servicing costs will increase. Yes, there are risks. But yes, we should also acknowledge that his, the effective debt servicing costs at this stage are at a historically low level. And that gives an element of resilience because they are also brought in at relatively long durations. Ricardo knows all about this, that governments have extended the duration of their portfolio, of their debt portfolio. Third element, banks. We still can acknowledge and should acknowledge that the banking system is much safer and we should use the policy space. We have just brought out a blog on that, how the policy space was used with the pandemic. And here's one point why it's very important also to have better banks, safer banks, because I think now is not the time that banks can expect on the same kind of regulatory and policy support that you got with the pandemic, which means all the financing that has to be done now has to more genuinely come from the banks. And what we saw with the pandemic was the fact that the space was used that was provided with public guarantees, but not much beyond. 
And now is the time where this beyond going beyond has to work. And in that regard, it's also very important to have a banking system that works and is effective. That's what I can say on the policy mix. Perfect. That's very uh, comprehensive. So thank you. I th we will be discussing the banking union CMU and various other European integration mechanisms later throughout the day. So thank you for setting that up on the importance of the robust uh, banking system. I think it's uh, key. I want to pick up on some of the points that Marco, you, you mentioned, and I want to ask a direct question on, do you think that there needs to be a reform and a fundamental shift on especially things like the Stability and Growth Pact within the European Union, having, within the, having considering the last two crises and considering that it's been put on hold throughout COVID, and if there is a long-term crisis continuing with this war in Ukraine, then actually, should Europe take a step back and use this opportunity to rethink how it is structured? Yes, thank you very much. Let me just add one uh, flash point on uh, uh, what Rolf just said. Uh, I mean, the point on the labor market is actually very important. Um, I mean, we have seen throughout this crisis uh, and, and also throughout COVID, the degree of resilience of the labor market, which has been actually pretty remarkable. Um, and if one takes a, a bit of a longer term perspective backwards, I mean, there has been a silent revolution that has taken place in uh, Europe with the uh, very substantive, very sizable increase of participation rates of elderly uh, workers. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in the space of 10 years, uh, going up 10 to 15 points uh, are quite, uh, you know, it's showing also that reforms actually work. Uh, reforms, pension reform, reform take, tackling aging uh, uh, issues. And, the, um, and I think one of the important dangers looking forward actually is uh, to avoid, uh, avoid to, uh, you know, reverse these reforms which have put uh, actually also the public finances, but more generally the uh, labor market on a sounder footing. So this was just a, a, a little addition to what uh, um, Rolf just said. Yes, I think uh, um, on the fiscal side and the, and the fiscal rules, you have seen that uh, we have proposed to extend the uh, general escape clause uh, to 2023. So for the uh, next year also on, a, on, on the account of the war, basically. Yeah. So the huge uncertainty so to leave the degree of agility, capacity to react um, uh, also for, for next year in case of need. At the same time, what we said is that in terms of fiscal policy orientation, what I indicated before, this uh, uh, um, extension of the GNSK clause would not mean uh, free for all. Uh, countries uh, with um, higher debt should be uh, prudent, uh, and we indicated that they should keep current spending uh, below their medium-term uh, growth uh, uh, prospects um, and put a lot of focus on uh, investment, on the quality of public finances, uh, exploiting fully the opportunities of next generation EU, which is very sizable. Um, now, on the rules, uh, we have said also back in May um, that we would come back to the fiscal rules after the summer uh, break. So we are uh, planning uh, shortly after the summer break to come up with proposals. We are going to go in two steps. Uh, first, we are going to, propose to, to come forward with a communication which outlines the landing zone for the uh, revised uh, Stability and Growth Pact, so where we think uh, yeah, we, should, uh, uh, we should go. Um, what are the key issues? And then uh, after the discussion with the member states, we would come forward um, uh, with, the, with legislative uh, uh, proposals. Um, uh, we have two, you know, on the two regulations, which are the basis for the stability uh, and growth pact. Uh, so this is the plan in, you know, process uh, terms. In terms of substance, uh, I think there is an, uh, a few issues. One is that uh, we have to put the public debt on an uh, orderly, credible, gradual reduction path. Um, I think this can be done uh, 
uh, without uh, resorting to austerity, but with prudent uh, policies. And I think there is a very large agreement that the current rules that we have, that that should, uh, in average, go down annually by one twentieth of the difference between the debt and the 60 percent, is not an adequate rule. So that will have to be, in a sense, re, um, uh, reconsidered. We see that um, uh, I think uh, tailor-made um, uh, uh, debt paths rather than the pret-a-porter of um, you know uh, uh, with everybody following the same uh, degree of, of um, reduction of the debt is better, based obviously on commonly agreed principle and a common uh, in a common framework. The second theme is uh, we have to put the money where our mouth is. And that is the issue of the quality of public finance favoring uh, investment, in particular, um, in particular investment uh, on the green side, uh, uh, and you know all all the that needs to be done in order to meet the green and digital uh, digital transition. I do not think that a straight golden rule, green or another color, would fly, uh, but within a path of uh, more country-specific debt debt uh, profiles, I think it is possible to accommodate also in, uh, and provide incentives for shifting um, uh, shifting resources to the right uh, type of investment. Um, third element uh, is uh, we need to have rules which are more counter-cyclical. So I think here, putting more emphasis on uh, spending, letting um, you know, revenue fluctuate uh, uh, to respond to the um, to the uh, to, to, to the to the economy and to the to the economic cycle. I think seems to be uh, a, a good way to uh, uh, to go. All this has to be go hand in hand with more simplicity. I think it can be uh, achieved, and as well as ownership, which goes hand in hand with stronger enforcement. It is clear that we have stronger ownership of the national plans at the national level, then it gives us more legitimacy to implement the rules and to enforce, to enforce them, which is uh, key now in um, you know, ensuring uh, 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 proper um, public finances and fiscal situation going forward. Let me finish with one um, uh, important consideration. If we go back to spring um, 2020, so when the pandemic hit us, it was very important to reassure the markets, uh, reassure investors that the leaders in Europe, the European Union as a whole, leaders, uh, finance ministers, would, find, would you know, found a common response, rapidly so. And the fact that there was an agreement on next generation EU very swiftly, I think reassured the markets. It showed that there was a pilot on the plane. So this element here, provide a stabilization confidence to the market well before a single euro was actually disbursed on the next generation EU. So uh, jump to today, I think it would be very important also from the point of view of market confidence, given the uh, fibrillation that we see and volatility that we see lately, that uh, leaders after the proposal of the Commission, leaders, finance minister, the uh, EU, uh, uh, would find a rapid uh, agreement on a, on, a, on a landing zone. I think that would reassure uh, the markets, and I think it would be a very important development also from the point of view of uh, um, lessening mm -hmm. the financial stability uh, risks that I, um, I mentioned before. Thank you. I am conscious that we are sort of 10 minutes towards the end of this panel, which has been quite uh, uh, quite covering a lot of topics. So we have a question here from Slido. I was actually going to uh, break the, the rules of AFMI and um, for this conference if we didn't have a Slido question and ask if you just wanted to put your hand up and ask one. So please do feel free to do that. I'm going, I will, get, I will ask uh, uh, the apologies later. So, but first of all, we do have one here from Rolf. So you mentioned bank financing as being key for resilience in the policy mix. What are your views on market funding and the link between the two? Oh, thank you very much for, for that question, which is actually a 
great opportunity to leave one of the, the key messages that I want to have here. I mean, Europe is a bank-financed economy, that is very clear. It's clear that we want to get towards more capital market financing, market financing. And I can also understand much of the frustration around the processes and also maybe hopes shifting from, well, we maybe didn't advance as much as we wanted on banking union, now let's go to capital market union. For me, for Europe, it's the banks that have to turn savers into investors. We can, in my view, only be successful in broadening, deepening capital markets if we get the two things aligned. And from that perspective, we need to have keep the, the, the focus on both, and we cannot just move on once. And I think you should, <coughs> and for the banking system, it seems that it, it seems to me that there needs to be a lot of thought going into the processes, how you can facilitate that, and how you can bring the small firms, facilitate the f equity financing also of the smaller firms, and how you can indeed bring the retail savers, the, the small people, into the capital market. We have talked yesterday evening over lunch about financial literacy, and I was actually perplexed to hear how relatively little is we on how little we can count on that, even in a country like the Netherlands, where you have a broad-based, capital-based pension system, which is way beyond what you have in other countries. So even if, it, if it, this is the case in a country like the Netherlands, how much more mileage do we have to make in other European countries? That's a big challenge. It won't go overnight. But for me, this is a big task where the banks have to play a role. And we know all this counts for sustainable finance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we get and don't get it done. Thank you. We have a very good question from Fionn as well. Uh, that I wanted to get onto. So thank you for this. Uh, if we think that markets are not dysfunctional, why is the ECB so concerned with fragmentation and aims to target the BTP spreads with new instruments? So if I think, who wants to, who wants to take that? Uh, and I think Philip will answer this question. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be going <laughs> on to that. I think it's <laughs> so perhaps you've jumped the gun then. <laughs> but I think it, bring, it brings me nicely to actually, uh, perhaps Ricardo, uh, if you could offer a couple of thoughts on that question on the monetary policy spreads question within Italy and whether you think that the ECB's response has been, uh, ha has been enough or where, uh, what you would be hoping for in the next couple of a couple of weeks, if you could do that quickly, because I do want to ask sure. um, Mam here uh, a question as well. So, sure. Um, well, first of all, the, the Italian bond market is quite liquid, deep. Uh, it's because of the size of government debt. It's a big debt market, and <clears throat> so when investors want to express a macro view uh, about widening spreads, rising yields. Uh, obviously, they might tend to short the Italian market first. So um, that's what one factor. This, the second is that I think most market participants, and we've had extensive uh, conversations with them, once they learned that the ECB uh, was preparing an anti-fragmentation tool. They wanted to see it, and, and when they were sort of disappointment, disappointed by the announcements um, initially made by the ECB, then uh, the market became a bit of a target until then the ECB called an extraordinary uh, meeting to discuss the situation and hinted at uh, the, um, you know, likely the adoption of additional tools, um, which may be discretionary, have a little bit of an element of conditionality, they still remain um, to be spe specified. Uh, I think all of this is really not desirable. Um, in my humble view, if I had to say what perhaps could have been different in, in the strategy, is really the sequencing of the normalization of monetary policy. Um, that means uh, in the presence of clear signs that inflation was picking up last year, 
a deposit facility rate of minus 0 0.5 looked extremely abnormal. And uh, perhaps the level of interest rates could have been uh, changed earlier uh, with a different timing compared to the uh, QE program, whereas the sequencing that has been adopted is first we need to finish QE and then we raise rates. That means you're not really suggesting that you're concerned about the yield curve, you know, how the yield curve will be shaped as you perform. It's the opposite of what the BOJ is doing in a way, you know, with yield curve targeting. So I guess from the perspective of countries that are a bit more vulnerable uh, to this uh, market positioning uh, after coming you know, from a lull of two years where the markets have been relatively quiet, there's been some complacency for sure. Uh, I think uh, perhaps a different sequencing might have helped. Mm -hmm. The key point though, is that throughout this process, there's been no fundamental change um, in Italy's fis fiscal approach. The government has time and again confirmed its nominal uh, deficit targets. The economy has outperformed the other large European economies last year. Everyone keeps ignoring it. Everyone keeps misreading the business cycle in Italy. The statistical office was very prudent in Q1. They initially estimated a negative a change in real GDP, which, when the number came out, did not coincide with our now casting. Now the number is at last in line with what our now casting was suggesting, and our now casting is now saying that Q2 has a very significant increase in real GDP. And if we don't have a contraction in the following quarters, the annual growth rate will be at least in line with our official target. Thank you. And I can Thank tell you, you one last thing, because I do go around Italy, I'm meeting more and more uh, firms, people, seeing initiatives, in, especially in high tech, digital, um, uh, automotive, and, and those sectors, that there is a lot going on. And I, I'm seeing more dynamism than in the past. Uh, so I would like everyone to be a bit, you know, not to be following the usual cliches mm -hmm. and study a bit more the data, a study more. more the markets and the policy decisions of the government. Thanks, Ricardo. A bit more positivity there, which is nice. And actually, I wanted to end with you, ma'am, on that question on, so the OECD's projections, so base rate scenarios are, um, higher inflation, lower growth than others, uh, than, than other forecasts. Uh, and I want to ask, because I like to end on a positive, you touched on risks and that being put into your base rate scenario. Uh, what are the opportunities within Europe? So you've obviously got the green transition and you've just heard from Ricardo that it's not all, it's not perhaps as uh, negative as one might, might suggest. What are the opportunities that you see for that pathway to growth? Uh, um, I think um, uh, you've already said it in your question in <laughs> a way uh, on the opportunities. I mean, on the growth side, uh, I mean, just uh, the same as what Ricardo was, was just saying, uh, the, the news are really good in the first uh, um, in the first quarter, in the second quarter, uh, possibly in some countries. And so, yes, I mean, the, 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 the baseline is still to have some growth, although lower growth. Uh, the opportunities are many indeed. Um, the, on the private side, uh, the, the, this strong labor market that has been evoked uh, obviously reflects that something is functioning in, the, in manufacturing in Europe, in uh, uh, services, which are now having all these labor shortages. Uh, on the government side, of course, uh, I mean, we've all been talking about green growth, about uh, uh, digitalization. This is seen in all the recovery plans for, uh, y that, that have been uh, put forward. Um, and actually, the opportunity of the EU funding um, is that, uh, you know, overall we've been talking about reducing, uh, fisc starting fiscal consolidation. But on the other hand, uh, these plans have given some breathing room to be able to prioritize, to go ahead with investments despite the reduction uh, in current spending that has to, to, to come up. So 
um, I'll just leave it at that. Perfect. And I'm going to leave the final word to Agnes. If you could summarize the French presidency or look at what the baton that you would want to move uh, move on, what, how would you do that? What do you think has been the, the success of the, the last sort of six months within, within the EU Council? <laughs> I think what makes success is to kickstart uh, very, very fast the, the discussion around the Fit for 55 mm. uh, package and to uh, have everybody concentrating on one key priorities, which um, embodies a lot of things, including uh, macro um, uh, prospects. Uh, if you think that the green transition is mainly about uh, a switch between consumption and investment, mm -hmm. so less consumption, more investment in the private and in the public sector yep. going forward. So this has to do with the fiscal rules. Uh, Marco was mentioning uh, the quality of public finance, uh, but it also has to do with um, uh, private behavior, the incentives, uh, private savings, uh, retrofitting, uh, investing in house retrofitting rather than consuming, but that it has implication on us at the sector level in terms of reallocation of labor, reallocation of capital. So it, it's the whole macro thinking uh, that needs to be uh, put in, uh, be consistent with, with, with the stories. So we, we really need now to, uh, to embody the green transition into our standard macro thinking about the future. And the long term has become the short term. That is uh, an excellent end to the wide ground that we've covered. So thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you uh, for your questions. We're now very pleased to hear from Philip Hartman, who is the Deputy Director General of Research at the European Central Bank, who has a presentation. So we will exit the stage, let uh, Philip come, and then I will be doing a Q&A with Philip. So please do think of questions while he's speaking. <laughs>